Sure, whatever. Uh, you wanna go back? What? Did you Dr. Have to Seymour? Right? You remember Danny Miller? He's out under another name. They convicted me for a crime that I didn't commit, and you basically sentenced me. You know, there's, there's nothing like feeding a mind that can take everything you can give it and then comes back asking for more. He's a good kid. Yeah? How can you be so sure? Do you think he honestly ran across you, or do you think he found you? We ran into each other at Pete's. You need to stop coming to my house, do you understand? You're hurting me, Dr. Steele. You're safe here, Danny. You understand that. It is not known where Daniel Miller was relocated after his release, but Miller's father spoke with us earlier this afternoon. Why he's out is beyond me. I want you to stay away from him. Danny seemed to enjoy the act of it. Lauren, step into the other room right now. Is Danny? Everyone wants to know, or is it who is Danny? Don't be alone with him. I'm not worried about that. Fuck you. Give it up one more time for this crew. Let's hear it. Hello. Yes, I love this poster. Yeah. It's so great, isn't it? It's, it's, Tell them about it. Who, who designed like the poster? Uh, we designed the poster with um, a friend of mine who does artist posters for people like Kara Walker and Kiki Smith, and they, they have the Neiman Center. Roy Neiman was a brilliant designer, and I wanted it to be like uh, Saul Bass, who was Hitchcock's poster designer, like Can the you Vertigo say the name poster. of the person who did the artwork, or no? Yes, there, uh, um, Thomas Vudaniel, yeah. He's great. And, and yeah. what made you go? I think that opens up to what kind of film you're making. What made you go with Saul Bass? Where did you get that inspiration? Well, uh, you know, the, the book that this is based on is also a thriller, but I grew up loving, and I'm sure a lot of you do too, I love uh, B-movies, I love noir, and I love thrillers. And I see thrillers this today and these days, but I, uh, I don't see anything you know, that sort of quite had the sort of philosophical questions that this one asked as well. So I wanted to make this book into a thriller like the movies that I grew up loving, those dark movies with sort of noir-like characters that have questionable morality and characters who take dangerous steps forward. So that's what I wanted to make. That's what I made. Thrillers these days are sort of inseparable from action movies, I would feel like. They're essentially about advancing plot and getting to a set piece, whereas this is about sort of one big story and the, the manipulations that happen within it. Did you ever have any sort of insecurities about sort of pushing the drama forward as much as possible and what a thriller is like now compared to the kind of thriller you wanted to make? I mean, I think I was definitely thinking of the throwback movies like, um, obviously, Cape Fear, you know, and the darker stories that really delve into the psychology of the characters. That's what I love. And so action was important, but uh, we were we really worked to kind of measure how much information to give out, you know, at what time and slowly to build suspense while never losing the character's psychology. And it was a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, yeah. we did we did have to work at it. So how did you reserve judgment for your character, Josh, going into something like this? Because with a character like this, you can play him a number of ways. And some of those ways are reserving the judgment completely or having a set idea about him and playing I, into it. I mean, that. I, I think you always reserve judgment on a character you're playing I, because you're playing him. And so <laughs> most often, even the most sort of morally <laughs> ambiguous characters, um, you know, when you're stepping into their shoes, they don't feel that way about themselves. I mean, most often. So I, you, you try, I think it just serves you to take judgment out of, of playing someone. It doesn't usually help you. Um, so I don't know. For me, what I liked about it um, you know, was just the experience of working with Betty. It was digging into this, getting to read Pat Barker's beautiful book and, and see the screenplay that Stephen and Frank had, had written and then working on it with Betty and, and trying to just sort of 
make this beautiful book into a, a film that was um, was a challenge because the book's book's very internal book, um, and I and I think Betty just really took it and made it very cinematic and atmospheric, and um, it was exciting. I want to talk about that in a second. I mean, turning something internal into into a film, but we talk- big microphone. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> but when we talk about judgment, the uh, the character himself. He's filled with judgments. He's a character that is making judgments of others consistently, and sure. it puts him in a place of, of righteousness a lot of times that he's unwilling to kind of, uh, until yeah. this moment that we, we see him in the movie, he's unwilling to really come to terms with and think about. Yeah. I, it, I mean, that's, it's a good point. I mean, he, he, he does do that. I think that's part of what he does for a living is to sort of, you know, I would say judge, but I would say explore people's unconscious and motivations. Um, but I think it's often true that... I mean, I, I wouldn't say across the board or generalized, but people that are drawn to that industry and that field, some say, um, do it out of a at a, out of a need, um, not look away from themselves, or 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 to to um, possibly that, and or some maybe do it to look more into themselves. But in this particular case, I would say um, I would probably say what you said <laughs> it would would be more fitting for Tom mm -hmm. um, that he he's learning more about himself through the process, but it's a very, I think it's a sort of micro level, sort of w just echoing what Betty was saying about the pieces to leave in and to, to take out. You know, it's, I, I like that kind of material where not everything's explained, not all the backstory, you get little pieces and you have to fill in the blanks. I like that as an audience member and I, and I like that, you know, um, we figure it out together, but yeah. it's intentional to leave some of it you know, um, not entirely spelled out. Yes. And I would say with a movie like this, one of the great dangers that you could fall into, which you don't, is that eventually things have to be explained. Eventually the mystery has to be revealed and exposition is always the crutch of, of movies like this. Fortunately, you don't fall into that. You're very good at steering away from it. Even when you are backed into a corner and there has to be that moment, you do a very good job of sort of pulling things away so it still feels like a natural conversation. How difficult is that as a storyteller? Because there is this idea of like, well, the audience has to know this at this point. We need to tell them this, but it still needs to feel like a natural conversation. I mean, a lot of it is, um, I mean, you do a lot of work when you shoot, but editing itself is a very important tool. People say sometimes that the first draft is when you're writing the screenplay many times. The second draft is when you're on set and you're really working with actors in a kind of organic and live way. And the third draft of the story is in the edit room where things shift and change like a sculptor. You're adding pieces, subtracting other pieces, and you really kind of finalize uh, what you're doing. And the thing about questions, I have to say, is that part of the story is that we, as a culture, want answers to questions that have to do with evil characters or with, you know, this sort of dark side of human nature. And we think that if you can um, explain that kind of darkness, that it can be treated by psychologists and social workers, et cetera. But what if it can't? What if we cannot explain um, something that, you know, you just don't understand but exists. What if there's just an evil that, yeah. that exists? Yeah, I mean, and, you know, sometimes you see it in whole countries and whole cultures. Sometimes you see it in people, and it Present. isn't always, yes, explainable, and that's very disturbing. And as a culture, I think we're attracted to that, but we're horrified, and so we have this sort of dual nature, and we well, it's read part books. of the collective, too. I mean, isn't yeah. it, is it part of the, the idea that, you know there is a part of that in all of us yeah. to some extent. I think so, too. <laughs> I mean, yeah. not to exaggerate yeah. it. Which but is I, what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that's that's part of what the film's exploring, certainly. Well, it's a, well let's talk about what the, the film is about. We've sort of gotten sure. into the weeds here and the yeah, details no, I, of the I, making of it. it and everything. I like the weeds. But so much <laughs> of it is about this idea of someone coming back into someone's life to either to learn from them or possibly to teach them something about themselves. Right. right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what are you, yeah, I mean... Um, and, and, you know, in that way that everybody has doubts about things they've done in their past, I think I'm, I like to make movies about how the past catches up to you, and it certainly does in one way or another, no matter how old you are, you know, you can go back. But in this case, you know, the Tom character is definitely haunted in a way by something from the past that he's now having to reconcile in the present. So Something yeah. he did as a child. Yeah, yeah. right. Which event, I mean... Yeah, right. It's something that happened before. And also, he's asked to make a decision about a character um, in an expert witness testimony. And so 
when you have somebody's life in your hands, you make a decision, and what if you have doubts? What if you made the wrong decision? How do you know? You know, I think it's a, a big question. I mean, and, and I think it's, it's one that's haunted him for a while in his yeah. professional career and in his life. Um, and, you know, when the film sort of takes off, you know, this character is thrust back into his life. And he has that opportunity where I think he's afraid of it on one level. He's also excited about the possibility of being able to explore yeah. um, something that he feels a tremendous amount of guilt and responsibility over. Explore redemption. Whether it, whether it can sure. exist and whether, you know, it do, whether it does or it doesn't. Yeah. Right. Which is another question, you know, of the film. Yeah. Do you believe that it exists? I don't know. <laughs> do I believe? I, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes, I guess. Sometimes. Depends. I know, like, I would hope, like, if I, can't, if I can't believe in redemption, I don't know where to yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. <laughs> sometimes sometimes it's, it's maybe not redemption. It's something else, whatever that other else thing is, yeah. you know, that you don't know that you could give it a name. I would say going back to uh, what, one of your first films that I love, Variety, which is just such a, a, cla a New York City classic at this point, you've always been somewhat obsessed with power and exploitation. And I would say exploitation less so in this film, but it's kind of there. But where do you think your obsession with power dynamics comes from? Hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a, good a little question. bit of a psychoanalytical question, yeah. And um, go. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I mean, on the couch, guys. Yes, okay, everybody. So I... I mean, I think with Variety particularly, I was interested in the way... Uh, I had been reading a lot um, about film theory and very influenced by what, um, you know, some of the really interesting critics, a woman named Laura Mulvey, who wrote an article called Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, in which she posited the idea of the female is always the object of the male look, and that in watching images that we as females often are the uh, the holder of the look, but not the looker. Mm. And I wanted to be the looker. I've always liked to watch. You know, perhaps I'm a voyeur as much as anybody who goes to the cinema, because that's what it is. We are looking into this kind of invisible world mm. that can't look back. So that power dynamic started to interest me. And so I took a female character, and instead of her being followed by um, a man, as in Vertigo with Jimmy Stewart, I said, OK, what if she's the, the follower? not the person being followed. And it just opened up this whole terrain of pornography, of sexuality, of desire. And ever since then, I think even probably before that, but ever since then, I'm interested just in the dynamics between two people who, um, you know, whether it's a Jekyll and Hyde or a, a social or... How do you feel this one different? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Please. Oh, yeah. How do you feel this, this film differs from your other, other films? I think or, and where do you feel like it's similar? Yeah, that's a hard question. I think, you know, I'm starting, what, what always interests me is that, you know, I've made a number of features, and each time I realize that I think I've done something different, mm -hmm. actually, it's a <laughs> lot like, you know, you start to see your work in a, in a bigger way when you can step back. And I think that there's more similarities than differences, just in terms of these struggles between characters and, kind of, and also moral ambiguity, always, mm -hmm. that I think my themes are pretty much there. But in this film, I felt very confident. I felt very good, um, having learned a lot from the previous ones. And I, I felt you know, very much in control, whereas earlier, you know, when you're exploring, you don't always know where you're going, so you're paying attention to your instincts, which I still am, but yeah, I think it's just a sense of knowing better, you know, what I'm playing with, and it's always a, a kind of a game to see at, who comes out on top. At the risk of this sounding like a, it's a pejorative, did this film feel less personal to you in a way, because you had a command of the themes that you've always been exploring, and sort of knew they were there, and you could explore them now in a, in a genre, like a thriller? Well, uh, this particular film, actually, Josh knows that I had lost a really good, very close friend of mine who passed away, who was killed by her son. And it threw me into sort of this crazy, horrifying state of mind. And so in trying to deal with this, um, somebody gave me the book to read. And the book dealt with questions about mm -hmm. um, behavior like that. And it opened up a territory for me to explore the kind of answers that I was hoping to get. And people often say, well, did you get them? And I say, well, actually, no. But the process of, and it's always the process that opens up some kind of, you know, you, you, you gain something even if it's not the answer, mm -hmm. right? So it is personal, too. Well, and I felt that uh, Betty asked me to, to, to take part in the film. We sat down, and she told me the same story and then read the book. 
I was in immediately just for after talking with her and seeing her, you know, intensity and passion behind it. So that in a way, when you said that, it's interesting because I wanted to hear what she, what her answer was because I yeah. thought it's probably one of her most personal films yeah. because of that, because of the drive behind it, right? Yes. Because of what what motivated you know reading the material and that that you know obviously it's a very sad story, but it excited me that she wanted to get into those terrains. I didn't know and any that was other part parts. of part of the fun was to do that with her. You know, it's a genre that we've seen. But to, to hear what how she wants to make it and the kind of atmosphere and tone that she wants to create around it was something that I wanted to be a part of because I think she's fantastic. Uh, how does working in a too. how does working in the structure of a of a sort of set genre not to say that this plays entirely by the rules of the genre or right. is, you know formulaic in any way it's not but how does working within the structure of a genre affect the way that you make a film? I mean, how does it change your personal interaction with the story and the themes? Well, I mean, I think you you know what the rules are of the genre, and I'm always, I always follow anticipation mixed with uncertainty. Those are my two uh, sort of key ideas in my head. And um, even if it's a dramatic narrative, you know, that isn't so much a thriller, but understanding that it's not what's happening now, it's what's happening next. And if we keep that momentum and that motion going, it's not now, it's what you want is the audience to be saying, oh my God, and then what's gonna happen? So you really, you know, you have people um, hoping and fearing and, you know, that's what I wanna see is, you know, the sort of engagement, you know, on, on that level too, which is um, an instinctual level and also on, a, on the level of the bigger questions of what is behavior and how do we explain it or maybe we can't. So I, pl I play by the rules, but I also smuggle in, you know, my, my sort of philosophical thinking about the ideas. You know, you had said something a, a few minutes ago about being a, a, a female director and about sort of a, being behind the, a woman being behind the camera, unlike when men are behind the camera. And Jill Soloway had said something a couple of years ago about women and desire and it being difficult to be a female director at first because as a, as a woman, you're not taught to state what you desire, to be upfront with what you desire. Whereas you made Variety as your first film. Right. Do you think that that about was About desire. Kind of, well, that's what I mean. Do you think that that was coping with the idea of being a female filmmaker while telling that story? Do you think that was coming from a place like that? I think I've always been a bit of a kind of somebody who likes to subvert things and kind of like dig underneath and like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who likes to be a little bit naughty and playful. So I, I was not uh, really thinking about that. I was just thinking about, wouldn't it be great if I could take a hold of this thing and just turn it around and like, you know, look back. You know, I'm not one to worry. I'm not one to think, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I just do. You know, like I just completely dig my heels in and, and go forward. And, you know, it's what I've always done. So, um, but I, but I w would take desire and explore it rather than, you know, kind of say, oh, it's hard. It's not hard if you own it. And I own mine, you know, including, you know, sort of sexuality that was explored, you know, pretty intensely in variety that really put it out there, you know, and I thought that was important, so. Whereas the exploration of desire in this is the desire for justice and, and, and redemption and Well, I think it's something. quite erotic, actually. I think that there's a kind of, you know, sensuality even to the whole story in terms of um, the male-to-male -male relationships, male-female relationships. I mean, I think, you know, there's there's more to it than just, um, you know, the the questions of um, right and wrong or, you know, morality. It's It's... In human interaction carries with it a lot of different layers, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's not obvious, but I think underneath it, you know, there's this question of what, what, it, what are our desires? You know, sometimes they're so unconscious that we can't even speak them. And that's what interests me. What we can't speak, we have to figure out another way of, you know, saying it, and, and it comes out anyway. Mm. Let's get some uh, question or two from the audience. What do we have here? Right here. Hey, thank you for being here. Uh, what was it like working with Avin Jogia, who played Danny? Yeah. Um, it's fun for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I love Avin. He's a he's a he's a, he's a fine actor. Um, was not familiar with him before working with him on this. Uh, although I quickly became aware when I looked him up that he has like a million and a half Twitter followers. So obviously, I was. I mean, it made me feel very old. Uh, and I joked about that with him, but he's he's a really good guy, good actor, um, and he was game. You know, uh, we 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 were doing a lot of work on the on the film leading up to it and rehearsal and and kind of a lot of our dynamics and tweaking and changing. And he was really game on stuff. And and uh, 
I really enjoy working with him, actually. We had Did a really you guys good get a lot together. of rehearsal time? Well, not, not, I would say a lot, but the compared rarity. to like some movies where we yeah. don't have any, yeah. we, we definitely had a couple bit. days around yes. the table. But yeah. Betty and I worked, I'd say, before we started just like every day or every other day for about two or three weeks just sort of yeah. talking and what about this and thinking about this and reading the book and what about this passage? Is there be a way to find this? You know, because this book is so beautiful and internal and this beautiful meditation, but you can't make that book into right. a movie yeah. per se, you know, but, but the world of it was we were inhabiting and I was just constantly trying to and, and Betty was just a sort of, you know, neither of us are sort of, I would say, writers, right? No, Primarily. No, so I we were sitting there digging yeah, in sort yeah. of, what about this? And so she was always sort of countering it with like, well, we don't maybe need to say that. That's clear already. Or how can we do that, you know, cinematically as opposed to necessarily having this as a scene? You know, so it was fun. It was fun to, that process was really great. And when, when Avin came in, he was just completely game. And yeah. um, I think he did a great job in the film. And, and he's a really good guy. Canadians, they're cool. What can I say? Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, cool. I hate to generalize, but it's like I've, I've yet to meet a Canadian. I was like, they're not yeah. they're all pretty cool yeah. people. <laughs> uh, next question. <laughs> true. Hey, Josh. Uh, hey, what's up? So you're in one of my favorite movies, uh, Dead Poet Society. Oh, cool. And I was, mm -hmm. um, I know you've done some like comedic shows, like uh, White Hot American Summer yeah. and uh, Kimmy Schmidt. Uh, uh -huh. How much do you try to vary the type of like roles Work, or yeah. like genres that you get, and do you have um, a preference for one? I think it's you know it, it's um, there's no real like I, I don't have like a plan about it, but I think I don't know if it's just someone was saying to me. I mean, relate to to what you do as a director. I think it was someone was saying Truffaut when he made a film. Every film that he set out to make was in direct opposition to the previous film that he had made. Um, that he was always trying to do something completely different. Yeah. And I wouldn't say, like, as an actor, we don't have the luxury of, like, I'm not generating the work usually, so it's not, I don't have that kind of... But I am always looking for something that's in, in, in contrast to what I've just been doing. So I, it, 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 that naturally flow tends to take me, like, this fall and, you know, was doing a lot of... Uh, this new season of Kimmy Schmidt, a bunch of those, and did we did a new season of Wet Hot, um, you know, and, and before that made a, another independent film... Um, called Amateur, and now I'm doing a play that's funny and serious, I yeah. guess. It's kind of both. But, I mean, you're always trying to... It, it, but it's it, it's in context to what you're doing previously and what you think you're going to be doing later. So, I, And I really enjoy doing comedy. And I think it's also when you, when you play a television character for five years on something, you know, people have a kind of idea, and they forget that you do different things. So some of that's also me, like, wanting to remind people and keep people guessing about what I, it is I do and don't do and... Because people are very quick to say, oh, right, you are a lawyer, and, you know. <laughs> and then that's what you do, right? Well, I do that, but I try to do other stuff, too. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Right hey, there. guys. Hey. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what was the challenge of trying to adapt a, a book into a film? Like, were there like, yeah. any certain liturgies that you have to take? They, I, we'll, we'll both answer it. Yeah, you, you go. go. You, yeah. Well, I mean, for me, I will say, like, I, when I was asked to do the film, I sat down with Betty, and I think... I, I, I read the book and I loved it. And all I could think about was like, how can we get more of the book into the film, mm -hmm. into the screenplay? And it was, it's hard because you, know, you have to acknowledge that it, it, they're completely different mediums. Yeah. So that was a lot of, I think, and, and I fell in love with Betty because as you can tell, she's just so eloquent. Yeah, and, but I and fell in love with you. No, but she's just like, she's so smart and you know, she, she's this incredible what a director. Hang. Come on, guys. Yeah. No, but she. <laughs> She's this, yeah, yeah. she's this incredible director who who also teaches directing at Columbia for many years, and and so she just has she just knows cinema so well, and you feel really uh, for me as well like an aspiring director as well as an actor, just like really um, just like I don't know, it's great spending time with her and hearing her process and how she thinks about it, and knowing that this film was a very personal film for her. But I think part of what, what our beginning work together before any we met with anybody else was just her and I meeting at the Marlton Hotel yeah. for like probably of three weeks straight just every day in the morning and we'd spend three hours together and sometimes the other people would come but it was always about talking about the script going through talking to get about from, Tom's journey yeah, yeah. how do we get from here to here how do we things that I wanted where she would say you know yeah that's good but how do we get that in there because right. we you know it, it can't just be two people talking the whole time like a lot of the book is which is the yes. two of them sitting in a therapeutic environment so that was really that was a fun part of the process yeah. for me um, and I think some of our work landed in there and found yeah. its way in 100%, places you know yeah. it just it was sometimes like you said just 
you know, earlier to your, your answer to his question, it's like sometimes it's like asking the question, you know, or the journey itself that yeah. produces it, not necessarily that you get all the answers. I can't even tell you what it is that got in there, but I know certain oh, things Oh, definitely, did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the work that we did together was so great. It's so enjoyable because we just, our minds kind of fused together and we we really kind of charted the path. And I, I, I can do that a little bit, but not until I have my actor. Yeah. And you, he, Josh was so essential, I think, to really... You know, you have somebody in mind, but once it's, there's a, a real human being there, it just everything comes alive, and that's really what happened. And we even moved things, we combined a few things, yeah. and he could see things that I could no longer see because I'd been working on it for two years. When you came in, it just gave that, you know, kind of new perspective, and then we went to, like, a whole other place, which is the movie. Yeah, really. I, I would say a big part of it is also just... The challenge to get back to your specific question is just you know books are books you know there there are 15 pages of talking about Tom's inner life you know and how do you how can you how can you get that into a filmic moment that can say half of that you know in in a right. scene or a shot or a look that was that's part of the excitement and what I think she's very good at and also our launching how we were launching it to me that was important as well there's a beautiful meditative quality to the book. And the film obviously is a psychological thriller in a certain genre, but how can we infuse as much of what is special about that book, about that ruminating on evil, on our mistakes, our choices, living in that uncertainty in that kind of messy place was really fun. Part of how we launched that was I think with the with this idea of, you know, Tom's guilt mixed with Danny being a little less aggressive at the top. Yes, you know, so yes. that we're not quite sure. What does you know, Danny want? Does he really need help? Is he a wounded animal? Is he sort of setting Tom up? I mean, all these things were kind of fun, but I think it helped us if we were, if we were less sure of it, yes, right? Yes, yes, and, and that was a kind yeah. of a lot of the work. If I would say, a lot of what we did was less about Tom yeah. and more about yeah. how does this... How does Tom get hooked into this story right, where it's right. believable that he wouldn't just go, hey, I want to call the police. Like, yeah. this is crazy. So that, that was part of the fun of it. Right. And just crafting those moments. But you should really read the book. It's a great book. Yeah. And her work are is important. really... <laughs> she's a fantastic writer. Yeah. And... Wonderful writer. British, <laughs> award-winning, you know, and she's... Uh, you know, you can't put it down either. No, it's so yeah. good. It's yeah. See the movie so first this weekend. Like, of course, see the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, once see you the see movie. the movie, read the book, yeah. because books are good, too. Yeah, but it is true. The movie's you know. different. I mean, it's the you movie, is, it honors yeah. the book, but it's its own thing, and, and, and that's cool. And well, the, it had to be different, right, if the book is so yeah. so internal. That's right. So, I mean, when you asked the question of what, it, how was it adapting, what was it like for, you know, you were working with the writers, I would imagine. Right, oh, yeah, all the time. And what was your first What was your first sort of direction in for the writers when you were telling them to adapt basically an internal book. Okay, first thing is no flashbacks. What a writer can do in her or his voice is go back in time and say, well, he thought about the time when he was, you know, a child or whatever, mm -hmm. but we wanted our story to be in the present tense, going back to this anticipation, moving forward, you know, not flashing back, not using that traditional structure. So it was hard because a lot of it did go back and we had to kind of reweave the story so that it really happened in the present tense and that you had to feel. I think our motto in all of screenwriting from, you know, day one is show and don't tell. And I know that, you know, that's something that, you know, we say a lot and it's easier even saying it than doing it because we as a culture rely so much on words and yet film is about cinema, it's images, it's one shot to the next shot, enormous amount of information just in a shot of the way he's looking at the other character and what happens in between that is fascinating to me. So sometimes it's not what you say, it's the effect of what you say on the other character that I love. So mm. that's what I'm looking for when I'm doing an adaptation, is to leave the book a little bit behind and forget about the words. How, how often do you find this a really detailed question about filmmaking? Excuse me for getting kind of nerdy, but it's something Nerd that up, uh, right? people talk about. And I, I, I've noticed before, you have this script and when you get to the set and you start shooting, or maybe you realize it during rehearsal, that you don't need all the words that you have on the page. And you're sort of reminding me of the way that you were just talking about the way people look at each other, because that's the way you find it so often, is that what's been written on the page can be said with a look or a cut. Absolutely, sure. yeah. Show, don't tell. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, but, but, you know, dialogue is also essential, and that's what where, I mean, Frank, who is one of the writers, was a playwright, and I think the essential thing that he did was sometimes not even let people finish sentences, right? right? Also made very active. I mean, he, yeah. it was a lot, it was, you know... Um, yeah, 
I mean, that's, I mean, for me, I'll say, like, having done so much television of late, like, it's nice to, yeah. you know, independent cinema, it's, look, it's imperfect. I mean, you know, you're, people are working hard for no money for a long time, yeah. trying to make trying a story. Trying to get your money. Yeah, to just sort it, of, yeah. you know, it, it, it's a long process, but it's a nice feeling to, like, step on a set and, like, it's not about, like, necessarily each word. I mean, that, that, that doesn't mean to belittle no. the, the screenplay. I, my best friends are writers. It's more about the idea of, like, sometimes, like, you know, it's nice when when the director and what the director wants actually is at the top of the pyramid. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and, 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 and I've been it fortunate. Is, it is a director's medium, so it's nice to sort of have that feeling of like, yeah. do you think we need that? Maybe we know what we don't, I don't think. Or you just so figure it out on the moment. It doesn't have to be a whole conference call about it. It's just like, yeah. Right. Yeah. No one's standing there going, my words! <laughs> no, not at all. And I think like the, the idea is how do you take what's on the page and really translate it to what's going to be on the screen. Because if you just shoot what's on the page, you're only telling, like, the surface. And I love what's underneath the page. Sure. So, yeah. The subtext is uh, everything. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just, just, he just echoing said, what she was yeah, saying. He said subtext is everything, and he's 100% <laughs> right. It's a, it's a beautiful film. Uh, how can people see The Drowning? IFC, right up the street, right? Yeah. Starting on Wednesday, please come. Um, you know, it's, it's always important to be in a cinema and not always watch things, you know, at home, et cetera. But that feeling that you get in a room just before the lights go out, there's nothing like that. I so know. please come. Yeah, I, IFC, I starting Wednesday you. and running. Okay. Guys, Josh Charles, Betty Gordon, thank you so thank much you for being so here. Thank you so much. Thank you, all. Thank you.